بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray, we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I hope you will excuse me for lecturing with a mint in my cup. Today's class is probably the most important of all the classes we've been having for the last three months. So today I need your special attention. We have had four ahadith so far on Gog and Magog. And one verse of the Quran, of course, from Surah al kaf where a people spoke to Zulkarnain and said to him, Inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil ard. O Zulkarnain, surely Gog and Magog, these two tribes of people, are committing fasad in our territory. We have translated facade, wickedness, oppression, that which corrupts. This was the verse of the Quran. And then <coughs> the ahadith, the first one was that Yajuj is an ummah of Banu Adam. So human beings like you and I, and Ma'juj is an ummah of Banu Adam, so human beings like you and I. One is the active tense and one is the pass passive tense. And so they seem to complement each other, like the night and the day. And so we're dealing with human beings like you and I. You can't recognize them by looking at them. The second hadith, also from Sahih Muslim. I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. Hmm? And so they have a power which appears to be indestructible. And so they have a power which is comparable to the power of Zulkarnain. When they are released into the world with that indestructible power, they take control of the world. But when they take control of the world, it's permanent. No one, no one can displace them. The third hadith <coughs> that we had on Yajuj and Majuj was the very strange one about Kiyama, the resurrection and now the judgment. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Adam alayhi salam. We said that this hadith is to be found in Sahih Bukhari four times. Now, every time we quote a hadith, you will find it in the text. The chapter on Ya'juj and Ma'juj in the, in the book, Jerusalem in the Quran. Hmm? You'll find the text of the hadith there. <coughs> Adam alayhi salam and his Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Adam alayhi salam, take out or separate the people for Jahannam. And Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies and he says, out of every 1,000, take 999 for Jahannam. And then the companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam were terrified. 
And so he smiled. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And he said, Bushra alakum, good news for you. The one for Jannah would be from you. Someone who follows the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The true religion. But he went on to say that the 999 would all be Ahlu Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. In other words, that Gog and Magog would cause all of mankind except those who follow the Sunnah, all of mankind, to be embraced in the way of life of Gog and Magog. So one way of life would sweep the whole world. One global society emerges in which all of mankind live essentially the same way of life. Peripherally, peripherally, they may be Jew and Hindu and Christian and Buddhist and Muslim and this and that and the other. Peripherally. But essentially, they all live in the way of life of Gog and Magog. And they all go into the hellfire. And so the way of Gog and Magog is essentially a godless way. In other words, that while in the case of Zulkarnain, power, power which to control the world, to establish a world order, power rests on foundations of faith. And when power rested on foundations of faith, power was used to punish the oppressor. Remember? And when power was used to punish the oppressor, there was an essential harmony between the world order down here and the world out there. Hmm? Harmony. And then power was used to, re <coughs> excuse me, to reward those who have faith and whose conduct was righteous. And so power was used to protect and preserve and promote the religious way of life. And then we also saw with Zulkarnain that power was used to allow those who lived <coughs> a primitive way of life to continue to live undisturbed. Now power, when Gog and Magog take control of the world with their indestructible power, power would, <coughs> would now rest on foundations which are essentially godless. And they are agents of facade. And so power will now be used to oppress. Not to punish the oppressor, but to oppress. And hence there will be disharmony, conflict, between that world and this world. And the heart of the believer would be uncomfortable in this world. Power will also now be used not to protect and to promote and to preserve the religious way of life. Power will now be used to wage war on the religious way of life. And since that religious way of life is preserved in its most authentic form in Islam, power is now used to wage war on Islam. This was hadith number three. <coughs> and then at the end of the class we came to hadith number four. 
And we said that this hadith was located in Sahih Bukhari. How many times? Eight, eight times. Repeated in Sahih Bukhari eight times. And that the hadith had come to us from four different companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu as the source of the hadith. And therefore it is called mutawatir. What is the hadith? The Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam has made the hijrah. He's in Medina. Seventeen months have passed and the Jews have rejected him. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the Qibla. And so the door to divine mercy is now shut for the Jews. At this point in time, the Prophet alayhi salatu waslam began to speak about Dajjal. And then he suspected a Jewish boy to be Dajjal. What was the boy's name? Ibn Sayyad. And he took Omar with him to question the boy, Omar radiallahu ta'ala. When he questioned the boy, the boy was rather impertinent in his replies. And so Omar was vexed, real vexed. He said, O Messenger of Allah, give me permission, I'll cut off his head. If Omar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was alive today, he'd be banned. He wouldn't be allowed to lecture. They'll ban him. They say he's a terrorist. <laughs> and in fact, I have something more startling for you. If Nabi Muhammad alayhi wasalam, was alive today, he'd be banned. They say he's a terrorist. He wouldn't be allowed. They say he's distorting Islam. We have the correct Islam, not the Messenger of Allah. Yes. Open your eyes. <laughs> so Omar radiallahu ta'ala who said, O Messenger of Allah, give me permission, I cut off his head. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, replied. He said, no Omar, don't do that. If he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him. And if he is not Dajjal, it would be sinful to kill him. Indicating that the possibility existed that he was Dajjal. But that possibility could only exist if Dajjal had been released. And so here is a hint a hint from the Messenger of Allah transmitted to us that the release of Dajjal has now taken place. It is at this time that the Messenger of Allah also begins to speak about Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And then he was asleep one day or one night at the wife, his home of his wife, Zainab radiallahu ta'ala <coughs> and he sees something in his sleep. It is something terrible, terrible, terrible. Because he wakes up from his sleep and his face is flushed red. It is not something ordinary and normal. And then he says, Wailul lil Arab, min sharrin qarik taraba. Woe unto the Arabs. Because of a great evil. Sharr means evil. Sharr, evil. Because of a great evil which is now approaching. Which is near. And then he raised his hands like this and made a circle. 
And he said, today, a hole has been made in the barrier, built by Zulkarnain. Who could make that hole? Could it be made by accident? Or is it, is it a hole which is made by divine design? It cannot be by accident. Because let us go back to Surah al -Kaf. After Zulkarnain had built the barrier, now Yajuj and Majuj could neither penetrate nor could they scale the barrier. Then Zulkarnain said, this is in Surah al -Kaf, he said, Hadha rahmatu mi rabbi. This barrier is rahma, an act of kindness from my Lord. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي But when that time comes of which my Lord has warned, جَعَلَهُ دَكَاءَ Allah is going to bring down this barrier. وَكَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي حَقَّ And then the warning of my Lord will come to pass. And so, no hole can be made in that barrier by accident. It is Allah, and only Allah, who can do that. And so what this dream indicates, or what this vision indicates, is that Allah has now decided to bring down the barrier. And therefore, the release of Ya'juj and Ma'juj now commences. In the case of Dajjal, I said that the release of Dajjal has now taken place. Taken place. But in the case of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, I use different language. I said the release of Ya'juj and Ma'juj has now commenced. Why? Why do I use the word commenced? Because of another hadith. Also in Sahih Muslim. That when Ya'juj and Ma'juj are released, the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee and they will start to drink the water. And by the time the last of them pass, they will say there used to be water here. Where is the Sea of Galilee? It is in the Holy Land. It is in the Holy Land. The Christians call it the Sea of Galilee. The Muslims call it Buhayrat al-Tabariyya or Lake Tiberias, which is a Roman name. And the Jews use a name which is in the Torah, Lake Kinneret. So there are three names for the same sea. The Sea of Galilee, Lake Tiberias, and Lake Kinneret. When Gog and Magog are released, the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee, said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, and they will start to drink the water. And by the time the last of them pass, they will say, there used to be water here. You can't drink up a whole sea of water in a day. Hmm? It will take a long, 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 long time. And so what this hadith indicates is that the release of Ya'juj and Ma'juj will not be all at the same time. 
the next ayah of Surah Al-Kahf, <coughs> after the ayah in which he says, this barrier is Rahmah from my Lord, but when that time comes of which my Lord has warned, namely Yawmul Qiyamah, Allah is going to bring down the barrier and then the warning of my Lord will come to pass. The next verse after that is one of the most difficult in the whole Quran. Allah says, وَتَرَكْنَا وَتَرَكْنَا بَعْدَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُ فِي بَعْدٍ وَتَرَكْنَ بَعْدَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُ فِي بَعْدٍ And on that day we'll cause them to emerge like waves, one after the other, and crashing into each other. We'll allow them to emerge like waves, mauj, mauj, waves. يَمُوجُ فِي بَعْدٍ Waves emerging one after the other but crashing into each other. And when that happens, the trumpet is sounded. But we can't hear. <laughs> we can't hear. Those who could hear would hear, but we can't hear. فَجَمَعَنَاهُمْ جَمَعَ And we then going to bring all of them, all of mankind together, one jama'at. Meaning, the eventual emergence of one global society. Today they call it globalization. They write books about it. The Prime Minister of Malaysia has written a book about globalization. But nobody bothers. Nobody bothers to go to the Quran. So that the Quran might explain the phenomenon of globalization. You've got Darul Looms. All over the world, Darul Looms. No Darul Looms in the world today. None ever bothers to go to the Quran. That the Quran might explain the phenomenon of globalization in the world today. None. And so, <laughs> surely, we need a wake-up call. But we have to give up the we have to give the wake wake-up call in such a way that people will not be angry with us. We have to give it in a gentle way. We have to give it with a smile. Now then, <coughs> some 50 years after the Hijra, which will be about 40 years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, we read in the books of Tafsir that the Khalifa sent an expedition to try to locate that barrier. built by Zulkarnay. The expedition went and they found the barrier. And they came back to report that it was located in a pass between the Caucasus Mountains where Asia meets Europe. The Caucasus Mountains. I don't know where the expression came from. But the white man today, the white man describes himself as Caucasian. Caucasian. The barrier was located in the Caucasus Mountains and the barrier was lying in ruins. These are what the companions of the Prophet ﷺ came back to report that the barrier was lying in ruins. And so Gog and Magog were released 
in the lifetime of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu Now today we turn <coughs> to another verse of the Quran. There are only two in the Quran, only two, which deal with the subject of Gog and Magog. So you have to be blind to miss it. In his wisdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained that there should be only two verses in the Quran dealing with this subject. What is the second verse? It is one of the most important in the whole Quran. It is in Surah Al-Anbiya. I, I wrote this at great speed, so my handwriting is a little bit crap of it. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَى قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَقْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ حتى إذا فتحت يأجوج ومأجوج وهم من كل حدب ينسلون. Two ayat there, 94 and 95. Or 95 and 96 of Surah Al Anbiya, which is the 21st Surah of the Quran. Haram, of course, means prohibited. Haram, prohibited. Qariya, Qariya is a town, a town or city. Halaka, to destroy. Ahlatnaha, we destroyed. We destroy, meaning we Allah. So haram, prohibited, a ban, Korea, a town, city, we destroyed, annahum la yirji'oon, that they, they, who, they, meaning the people of the town, which was destroyed, La yarji'oon raja'a to return. They can't come back. Mm -mm. They can't come back. Hatta, unless and until. Hatta, they can't come back. Until, until when? Futihat, to be released, to be opened. Is that Futihat? Yet Juju and Majuj, Gog and Magog are released. Only when Gog and Magog are released, Wahum, <coughs> and then <coughs> they, meaning Gog and Magog, mean Kulle Hadabin Yan Silun. Nassel is your progeny, your seed, nasal. Min kulli hadam, in every direction, yan silun. They're making carbon copies of themselves. <laughs> no? They're making ahlu ya'juj wa ma'juj. They're transforming all of mankind into carbon copies of themselves. And so now let's translate it. There is a ban. There is a divinely imposed ban on a town which we destroy. That having destroyed that town, it is now haram. It is now impossible. Allah makes it impossible. It is prohibited. For the people of that town to ever return, meaning 
to return to reclaim the town as they they can come back as tourists that's okay but you can't come back to reclaim the town as your own until when until Gog and Magog are released and when they are released they spread out in every direction meaning they take control of the world and they transform the world into carbon copies of themselves at that time you will see these people returning to reclaim the town as their own hmm? is this is in the Quran and we missed it for, for 1400 years this has been in the Quran and we missed it it's easy now <laughs> yes it's easy now when the translation is brought before you in the way I did for you to recognize what Allah is saying but until events had unfolded it was not possible for anyone including me to be able to understand what Allah was saying there let me take, give you an example I have a student of mine from a country called Niger in Central Africa his name is Sheikh Saleh Ibrahim. <clears throat> Sheikh Saleh Ibrahim is just completing his PhD in Islamic studies in Malaysia. And I gave to him a task. I said, Sheikh Saleh, you do the research. Come on. Go into every single tafsir of the Quran. You can lay your hands on and find out what is the explanation given. Listen to what Sheikh Saleh says. One day he might even come to Trinidad. He says, Muslim scholars have differed significantly in interpreting the sentence, they shall not return. There are four main interpretations in this respect. Number one, the they, the people of the town which was destroyed, will not return to life again after their destruction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that return to life haram for them, forbidden for them. But Allah has made that forbidden for everybody. Once you're dead, you can't come back. Eh? Once you experience something called mouth, can't come back. So it's not only for this time. So it's a curious statement here. Yeah? Okay? Allah has made that return haram or prohibited for them. This is according to Imam al Baydawi, Imam al Razi, Imam al Sa'adi ibn Kathir, al Jawzi ibn Hassan al Maruri, al Shawkani, Abdullah, Abdullah Yusuf Ali. I don't know how come Abdullah Yusuf Ali is here. He's not one of the commentators of the Quran. What Abdullah Yusuf Ali did was go to Cambridge University and do a bachelor's degree in English literature. That's where he has a genius in English literature. He then took an Urdu translation of the Quran. Quran translated into Urdu by the scholars and translated the Urdu into English. And then that, that, that caused him to become Allama Yusuf Ali. <laughs> Okay, the second one. That they will not return to Allah. That they will not return to Allah for punishment. As they believe the resurrection is impossible. That they will not return to Allah for punishment. Because they believe the resurrection to be impossible. But all must return to Allah for punishment. All. As such, Allah made that impossibility absolutely forbidden by using the word haram. The impossibility of returning to him for punishment is haram. Those affiliated to this interpretation is Al-Baylawi, 
Samarkandi, Shaykhani, Shaykhani, Maruri, Al Mansuri, and many others. A third interpretation that they will not return to repentance as they were destroyed spiritually. They will not return from the life of kufr and they will not repent until the day of judgment. One of the signs of which is the release of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, implying that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are used here to merely demonstrate the length of time they are bound to remain in kufr. This is suggested by Al-Baydawi, Samarkandi, Ibn Kathir, Al-Andalusi, Al-Basri, Al-Jawzi, Al-Shawkani, Maruri. A fourth, the fourth and the last. They will not return to the nature in which Allah had shaped them, the fitrah. That return is made haram for them. This is the interpretation of Muhyuddin, Ibn Al-Arabi and other scholars. What is our interpretation? This does not make us greater scholars than all the rest. It is just that you can see today what you couldn't see yesterday. You understand? Allah is speaking of a town. A town which he destroyed. And when he destroyed that town, the people of the town were expelled from the town. And after he expelled them from that town, he made their return to the town to reclaim the town as their own. He made that haram. He banned their return to the town to reclaim it as their own. You will not find it in any tafsir, the simple explanation. However, a moment in time will come when Gog and Magog are released and having been released, they spread out in all directions and hence they become the world order, controlling the world with their indestructible power. And then riding on the backs of Gog and Magog, these people will return to reclaim their town. Which town is it? How much time do we have? Which town is it? You know the answer already. Do you think the Darul Loom knows it? You think all the graduates of the Darul Looms know it? You know the answer already, but they don't. And the amazing thing is, no matter how much we keep on knocking on their doors, they will not, will not, will not understand the concept. Amazing to me. All right. How will we determine which town is it? Let us go to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Let him answer the question. Nobody has a problem with that. In other words, let us go to all the ahadith on Gog and Magog. And let us see whether there is any town mentioned in the ahadith on Gog and Magog. Any town which fits this description. Okay, today it's easy. <laughs> 15, 20 years ago, we didn't have the computers and the CDs. Yeah, I'm a scholar, I know. So you'll have to go to, you'll see 26 volumes lying there on the shelf. And when you see these 26 volumes, the tears will start flowing from your eyes. <laughs> You mean to say, I have to go through all of that? Just to extract all the ahadiths on a particular topic? No. Maybe somebody already did it. 
So let's go and see if we find a book or books written on the subject. So there's some scholar who previously went through all of it, had recorded it for you. Hmm? But there are no books on Gog and Magog. There are no books on Gog and Magog. There's one small booklet. And then there's a chapter in my book here. You can go find nothing else. But today we have the CD. <coughs> and you just type in Gog and you press and immediately you'll get all the hadith in Sahih Bukhari and all the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Then you go to Sahih Bukhari and you check it out, you see yes, computer correct. Hmm. So I did that. And I located all the hadith on Gog and Magog in the nine most important books of hadith. Hmm? The Seha Sitta plus three others. If you have these nine, you got the most important thing. And when I went through all the hadith on Gog and Magog, I found only one town. Only one town mentioned. Link with Gog and Magog. And it was a town which fit this description. It was Jerusalem. Of course, in the hadith it wouldn't be Jerusalem, it would be Beitul Maqdis, hmm? the Arabic name. And so I came to the conclusion, using Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, I came to the conclusion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was speaking about Jerusalem. And hence my understanding of this ayah is that Allah is saying <coughs> that he destroyed the state of Israel in the Holy Land. And he expelled the Jews from the Holy Land. And having expelled them, he then placed a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim the Holy Land as their own. Never. They could go back as tourists. Yeah. But they could never go back to reclaim it as their own. Until when? Until Gog and Magog are released. And when they are released, they eventually spread out in all directions. And hence with their indestructible power, they take control of the world in the world order of Gog and Magog. And then you will see these people riding on the backs of Gog and Magog. And they come back and they reclaim the Holy Land as their own. And they restore the state of Israel in the Holy Land. I came to this conclusion somewhere around 1994, so that's about 10 years ago. Sitting in my room in New York. It came as a flash. And as I recognized it, I began to weep. The chairs just kept flowing. Because I was able to see in a flash and understand the subject in a flash like that. It was Allah's grace to me. After I had come to the conclusion that this town is Jerusalem, in Sahih, in Surah, Surah al -Anbiya. Sometime later, I came across a booklet written by a Pakistani. Gog, Magog and the State of Israel. Small booklet. I have a copy. And I read the booklet with great interest. You don't find a booklet on Gog and Magog every day. But there's also one written by the Qadiani, uh, Muhammad Ali. Because Mirza Ghulam Ahmad made some important statements concerning Gog and Magog and the Jana. So I read this book led by this Pakistani. His name is Bawani. And the most important point which he makes in that booklet 
is that the town is Jerusalem. So I was not the first. There was somebody else before me. The rest of the booklet did not impress me. But this portion was impressive. But then I noticed in the preface, Mr. Bahwani records his thanks, his gratitude to Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari, who he said, explain the subject to him. Now you will excuse me if my logic is faulty. In fact, if my logic is falsely, you can throw me out of the classroom. You have my permission to do that. Throw me out of the classroom if my logic is faulty. I came to the conclusion that if this is the most important point made in the whole book, which is otherwise not an impressive booklet, but this is very impressive. The interpretation of a verse of the Quran. And if he says that Maulana Fadl Rahman Ansari explained the subject to him, and he thanks Maulana for that, I came to the conclusion that this must have been my teacher's position as well. If my logic is faulty, throw me out of the classroom. I came to the conclusion that this is evidence that Maulana Fadl Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, also held the view that the town was Jerusalem. If he held that view, then this is something tremendously remarkable. Because it's easier for Imran to see today than for him to have seen 40 years ago when this book was written. The state of Israel had just come into being at that time. The world of Islamic scholarship has, has not as yet been able to grapple with the significance of the emergence of the state of Israel. And yet, Mulan Fadl Rahman Ansari, 40 years ago, or probably a little bit more than 40 years ago, came to the conclusion that the town was Jerusalem. If and when I meet with Maulana, one day, after offering my salam, the first question I have to ask him is this. Now then, when we come back next Thursday, if Allah so wills, we have something tremendously exciting to do. We now have enough evidence with which to be able to build a profile of God and Magad and to now seek to identify them. Because we are looking for a people who are like Mutt and Jeff combined together. This way and that way, but they combine together like husband and wife. We are looking for a people who have power and whose power is such that the rest of the world combined cannot displace their power. And whose power is such that there is nothing on the horizon, nothing on the horizon which even remotely suggests that anyone can break their power. We're looking for a people who use their power to control the world and then who use power to oppress. We're looking for a people who use their power to totally corrupt the primitive way of life, to exterminate the primitive way of life as though they're just cockroaches. We're looking for a people who wage war on the religious way of life and who wage war on Islam and on those who will lead lives of piety and of righteousness. We're looking for a people who are going to emerge from somewhere around the Caucasus Mountains. 
We're looking for a people who hitherto had never walked on the stage of history. No, not like China and Babylon and Mexico and so on. No. And we're looking for a people with an obsession with the Holy Land. We're looking for a people with an obsession. That's the name of perfume now, isn't it? <laughs> obsession. We're looking for a people with an obsession with the Holy Land. A people who are obsessed with liberating the Holy Land and bringing the Jews back to the Holy Land. Who are these people? Gog and Magog. You better hesitate before you answer that question. Because once you answer that question, you put your foot on a road from which there is no return. There are awesome consequences from your accepting an answer to the question, who are Gog and Magog? Let us uh, end today's class here. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have arrived at by far the most important part of the subject of Surah Al-Kahf in the modern age. We are not simply studying Surah Al-Kahf, we are doing more than that. We are attempting to use Surah Al-Kahf to explain the modern, the strange modern age in which we now live. And we have now arrived at the most crucially important part of our subject. This passage, oh sorry, this subject deals with Gog and Magog and there is a chapter in this book which has the skeleton. I still have to put some flesh on it, but at least the skeleton is there of the subject. The basic information that you need on the subject is in that chapter on Gog and Magog. Outside of that chapter, there is very little that you will find published on the subject. Very, very, very little. And uh, Either it is wrong and misleading, as in the booklet published by the Ahmadiyya movement, Maulana Muhammad Ali wrote on the subject, or it is very, very scant. <coughs> and so I want to urge you to read that chapter of this book very carefully. Now then. <coughs> we have so far had the following ahadith on Gog and Magog. Number one, that Yajud is an ummah of Banu Adam. So they are human beings, like you and I. Majud is an ummah of Banu Adam. So human beings, like you and I. Yajud being the active participle, Majud the passive. So they are linked together. The second hadith, anybody help me? Yes? That's right. Hadith al Qudsi. Sahih Muslim. I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can fight them and destroy them. 
And so they have a power <coughs> equivalent to or even superior to that of Zulkarnain. Hadith number three on Gagan Maga. Yes. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, four times in Sahih Bukhari, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses Adam alayhi salam. In fact, we have a question on this hadith this evening <coughs> from his sister. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses Adam alayhi salam on the day of the resurrection, al ba'thu ba'd al maut and says to him, take out or separate the people for Jahannam. Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O oh Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies and he says, out of every 1,000, take 999 for Jahannam. The companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam were terrified and then he saw them and he smiled. And he said, good news for you, the one for Jannah, from now until the end of Qiyamah, the one for Jannah, meaning up to this day, sister, are you listening? Up to this day, up to this day in Trinidad, the one for Jannah, the only one who will enter into Jannah, is the one who follows the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam has come to restore the authentic religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, which came with Nabi Musa alayhi salam, which came with Nabi Isa alayhi salam, which came with Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. So if you live the follow the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam and you follow the way of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, you are assured of heaven. But the 999 are all Ahlu Ya'juj wa Ma'juj, indicating that Gog and Magog, when they are released, will eventually embrace all of mankind except the believers, the true believers, not the part-time. Gog and Magog will embrace everybody and get them to live the way of life of Gog and Magog. It matters not whether you are Hindu or Buddhist or Jew or Christian, whatever be your religion, that's peripheral. Essentially, you're living the way of life of Gog and Magog. And so one Jamaat emerges, they call it one global society, globalization. And all of these people will be swept down the river of no return into the hellfire. That does not mean that there is no hope for us. Of course not. The hope for us <coughs> lies in being faithful to the Book of Allah and to the Sunnah of His Messenger. I leave behind me two things. So long as you hold on to them, you will never go astray, meaning astray from the religion of Ibrahim The two things are the Book of Allah and my Sunnah. Good. Uh, another hadith on Gaga Maga. Yes? The Jewish boy is not Gog and Magog. The Jewish boy is Dajjal. Wake up. Yes? That's right. That's Hadith number four. <coughs> Remember that Zulkarnain had built the barrier. What did he use? Recycled paper? Iron and steel and then a co coating of molten copper. And when the barrier was built, 
then Yajuj and Majuj could neither penetrate nor could they scale the barrier. And then Zulkarnain said, this is an ayah of Surah Al-Kahf, has a rahmah to me Rabbi. This barrier is rahmah, an act of kindness from my Lord. For idha jaa wa'adu Rabbi, but when that time comes, of which my Lord has warned, ja'alahu dakka, Allah is going to bring down the barrier. Wa kana wa'adu Rabbi haqqa. And then the warning of my Lord will come to pass. So anytime you see that wall crumbling, know it is Allah who is bringing it down. Because the Quran affirms that it is Allah who will bring it down. When the wall comes down, then Gog and Magog are going to be released. <coughs> but the next ayah says, وَتَرَتْنَ بَعْدَهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ يَمُوجُ and I said to you, this is perhaps one of the most difficult verses of the whole Quran. This one. وَتَرَكْنَ بَعْدَهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ يَمُوجُ فِيبَ Mauj is a wave. Yamuju to come out as waves. And so Gog and Magog will not all come out at the same time. They will come out as waves. How long will it take to come out? What hadith do we have? Huh? Yes, what's the hadith about Galilee? Excellent, mashallah, I'm proud of my class. Outside of this class, probably nobody knows the answer. <laughs> Another hadith of Sahih Muslim which answers that question. How long will it take to be released? Because they're not all going to be released at the same time. They're going to come out in waves, in waves. And these waves that they come out crash into each other. Implicit in this is that each wave that comes out will be more powerful than the one which came before. So it'll crash into the one before and absorb it. Hmm? <coughs> and so the world will become more and more corrupt. More and more corrupt. You remember? Fifty years ago, when we were boys, our mothers used to wear dresses and the skirt used to reach down a little above the ankle, between the knee and the ankle. You remember? It's considered to be the fashion. Those are clothes our mothers used to wear. Of course, it was not in conformity with the Sharia. The Sharia it should have been all that. But that was what we used to have long ago. We didn't know the religion too well. And then came the age of blue jeans. Huh? And then came the skirts going up. And one day we see the skirt which almost the knee. And we say, what's happening in the world? Well, guess where it reached now? <laughs> yeah, my wife and I went in the shopping mall over here in Gulf City a couple of days ago. So let's go around walking. Guess where it reached now? Each wave that comes out, each wave that comes out is more powerful than the previous. It crashes into the previous and absorbs it, destroys it and absorbs it. And so the world grows progressively more corrupt. There is nothing outside of Surah al kaf of the Quran that will explain that dunya out there which is becoming progressively more corrupt. Nothing outside of this Surah of the Quran that can explain that. How long will it take to come out? The hadith of Sahih Muslim. The Prophet said, <coughs> when the first of Gog and Magog come out, the first wave that is, they will start to drink the water, which is symbolic language, indicating the uh, utilization of the water. And when the last of them come out, they would say, 
They will pass by the Sea of Galilee and they will say, there used to be water here. And so we have a barometer or we have a yardstick by which we can measure how much time remains before Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns. Why? Because Nabi Isa alayhi salam will return at that time when he is to kill Dajjal. But immediately after Dajjal is killed, and of course Mirza Ghulam Ahmad never killed Dajjal, Dajjal is still alive and kicking now. <coughs> Nabi Isa alayhi salam will kill Dajjal, and then after that comes the destruction of Gog and Magog by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Sahih Muslim. And so when you see the water level in the Sea of Galilee going down and down and down and down and down and the Sea of Galilee now looking very much as though it is destined to dry up. You know that the time is fast approaching hmm? for the return of Nabi Isa al-Islam and then comes the destruction of Gog and Magog. Okay? We had one more hadith. Namely, the hadith which gave us the indication that Allah brought down the wall and that the release of Gog and Magog commenced in the lifetime of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. What's the hadith? Where was he sleeping? At the home of his wife? Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, yes? And he saw something in his sleep? And when he woke up, what did he look like? His face was red and flushed. Meaning that he had seen, seen something really terrible. And then he said, Wailul Arab Min Sharrin Qarik Taraba. Woe unto the Arabs. Because of a great evil which will now come upon them. And then he raised his fingers like this and he made a hole. And this hole indicates a symbol. It says, today a hole has been made, futihat, the passive tense, meaning by Allah. A hole has been made in the wall. <coughs> and so the wall is now disintegrating. And Gog and Magog are now being raised in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. <coughs> Next week, we're going to take up another hadith which attempts to give a different picture that the release did not take place at this time, but we leave that until next week. And so we have the evidence. How often, how many times is this hadith in Sahih Bukhari? Eight times from how many different companions? Four. If a hadith comes from more than one source, it is called Anybody? Mutawatir. If it comes from one source, it is called Ahad. This is Mutawatir. Hmm? Good. Now then, in the last class, we went on beyond the Surah Tulkaf to God and Magad located elsewhere in the Quran. And we found that Gog and Magog were located in the Quran in only one other reference. In the whole Quran, there are only two. One is in Surah Al-Kaf, 
the other is in Surah Al Anbiya, the prophets of 21. There are two ayat, and here they are in Surah Al Anbiya, and this was the bulk of our class last week. Haram means prohibited. Prohibited. So haram here is a ban on Korea means a town. Ahlaknaha we this na here means we we destroyed it. Meaning we, Allah. Annahum, that, that, they, la yarjaun, cannot return. Hatta, until, idha futihat, when, Released Gog and Magog Wa and whom they min kulli hada from every Direction or in every direction, Yan Silun spread out. As though you are procreating. Our child here, your child, your child, your child, your plenty children you spread out. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ There is a ban on a town. أَهْلَقْنَاهَا which we destroyed. أَنَّهُمْ that they, the people of the town. لَا يَرْجِعُونَ cannot return. There is a ban on them that they cannot return to this town. Allah is saying. حَتَّى until you will see, thousands of years will pass, but they cannot return until, meaning return to reclaim the town as their own. They could come out as tourists, that's all right. But they cannot return to reclaim the town as their own. Hatta, until. Until God and Magog are released, number one, and having been released, secondly, they spread out in all directions. Meaning, they take control of the whole world. When they do that, it will now be the world order of Gog and Magog. No one can destroy it. No possible combination of rivals can destroy their power. No. But the power which they hold over the world, which is literally indestructible, is a power which is used to oppress, facade, is a power which is used to corrupt. And the world becomes progressively more corrupted. And oppression increases. As oppression increases, as the world grows more corrupted, as globalization marches forward, as they take control of the world in the world order of Gog and Magog, then you will see, Allah is saying, then you will see that these people who were expelled from this town, and who were banned from returning to the town to reclaim it as their own. You will see them returning to reclaim the town as their own. 
which down is it? To this class it is crystal clear. Alhamdulillah, to everyone in this class it is crystal clear. Praises you to Allah. But then why is it that outside of this class, hardly anyone will agree with us? Just go outside and ask my brothers, the learned and the distinguished scholars of Islam, who are more learned than I am. And I honor them and I respect them for their learning. And I do not in any way seek to uh, belittle them. But it is an amazing thing for which I don't have an answer. That outside of this class, you hardly find anyone in this country who will agree with the translation that I just gave of the ayah. Translation. We've not as yet interpreted. Translation. Okay, which town is it? <coughs> we said, let us use the Prophet Islam to answer that question. Remember? We said, let us go to all the ahadiths on Gog and Magog and see whether there is any town which is mentioned, which is linked to Gog and Magog, which fits the description. When we went to all the ahadiths on Gog and Magog, we found to our surprise that there is only one town. In all the ahadiths, only one town mentioned, which is linked to Gog and Magog. And that town is Jerusalem, Baitul Maqdis. And so we came to the conclusion, and we insist that this is the correct conclusion. That what Allah is saying in the Quran is that He destroyed the state of Israel <coughs> and He expelled the Jews from the Holy Land. And having expelled them from the Holy Land, He put a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim it as their own for 2,000 years. But that when Gog and Magog were released in the lifetime of the Prophet and then eventually over a period of time they took control of the world with their indestructible power and the world order of Gog and Magog was established. Then mankind saw the fulfillment of this prophecy in the Quran. Then mankind saw the Jews being brought back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own, indicating that Gog and Magog are the ones who are now in control of the world. They are the ones who have made the return of the Jews to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own possible. Yesterday, I mean last week, we also made mention of the fact, and I said, if you defer with me, you can throw me out of the window, you remember? That I was not the first to come to the conclusion that this town was Jerusalem. I said that somewhere in the late 50s, maybe in 58 or so, a Pakistani whose name was Mr. Bawani, Ibrahim Ahmad Bawani, Rahim of Allah, I knew him, wrote a little booklet, a pamphlet really, on Gog and Magog and the State of Israel. I have that booklet with me, that pamphlet. And in that pamphlet, the only thing that is really striking in its importance is his translation of this verse and his identification of the town as Jerusalem. The rest of the pamphlet is mediocre. But this is there, that the town is Jerusalem. And in the preface of this pamphlet, Mr. Bawani, <coughs> Mr. Bawani records his appreciation to Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah who he said explained the subject to him. And so I came to the conclusion 
that if Maulana Ansari explained the subject to Mr. Bawani, and if by far the most important point made in the pamphlet is the identification of the town as Jerusalem, I came to the conclusion that my teacher, Maulana Ansari, also held the view that the town was Jerusalem. Hmm? I read the pamphlet only after I had myself come to the conclusion that the town was Jerusalem. This was about ten years ago. And when I read the pamphlet that my heart was fluttering with joy, that my teacher also came to the same conclusion. And I said to you, if you feel that this was an improper interpretation I made out of that pamphlet, you can throw me out of the window. Now then, what remains is for us to now identify Gog and Magog. It will not suffice for us to say that Gog and Magog is modern Western civilization. We want something more precise than that. Hmm? From this passage of the Quran, Surah Al Anbiya, we know that Gog and Magog, when they are released, now listen carefully, Gog and Magog, when they are released, have a specific mission in addition to their general mission. Their specific mission is to liberate the Holy Land and bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. That's their specific mission. In other words, we are, we are looking for a people with a trademark. Their trademark is an obsession with the Holy Land. Hmm? To liberate it and to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. Can we identify these people? Okay. <coughs> I want you to look at Europe, the white world. Prior to the time of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, and then look at Europe, the white world, after the time of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. In reference to Europe's relationship with the Holy Land and with the return of the Jews to the Holy Land. Did Europe ever control the Holy Land prior to the time of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam? The answer is Yes, at least on two occasions. Number one, Alexander, who is known as Alexander the Great, the Greek Emperor, conquered Jerusalem and uh, held discussions with the rabbis. But Alexander and his Greek Empire never considered Jerusalem and the Holy Land to be anything more than just another occupied territory. They never considered the Holy Land to have any special status. Good. Who else from Europe? The Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, when Rome was pagan, and then the Roman Empire, when Rome became Christian, Constantine. And at, on both occasions, the Roman Empire never considered the Holy Land to have any special status. You can go and see the movie, Passion of Christ, and you see the Roman government <laughs> in the Holy Land. They never considered this to be other than just a backward province of the Roman Empire. Now look at Europe after Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Europe rapidly becomes Christian after Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Christianity spreads quickly. 
And then suddenly, the Pope, a white man, eh, is obsessed with liberating the Holy Land. And he initiates what is called a holy war, a jihad, to liberate the Holy Land. They call it the Crusades, it's a holy war. <coughs> Karen Armstrong has written a book which is with a gold mine of information on the Crusades. Very difficult to get it outside. And I bought that book in London while I was there last summer. And I've read the book. The Crusades are now initiated one after the other. A number of Crusades. What is the purpose of the Crusades? To liberate the Holy Land in the name of Christianity. Hmm? But is the white man the only Christian? Huh? Christianity was in the world long before the white man became a Christian. Christianity is an oriental religion, it's a Semitic religion. Started in the Holy Land. Huh? The Byzantine Empire had already emerged as a Christian empire before Europe became Christian. And now Europeans march to the Holy Land to liberate the Holy Land in the name of Christianity. But guess what? Has it ever occurred to you that no other Christians participated in the Crusades? Only the white? Nobody else? Isn't that strange? And secondly, that when the white crusaders pass through the Byzantine Empire to get to the Holy Land, they fought their own Christian brothers. How come? Only the white Christian wants to liberate the Holy Land. No other Christian participates in the Holy Land, in these holy wars, these crusades. I want to suggest to you a new way of looking at history. That the crusades were not Christian wars. That the crusades were the white man's war. The Crusades were European wars masquerading as Christian wars. A PhD in deception, masquerading as Christian. But they were essentially the white man's war, European war. And when <coughs> Europe decided to cast off the clothes of Christianity, as unceremoniously as Europe had adopted itself to be Christian, one Sunday morning Europe decided we don't want to be Christian anymore. Hmm? And now Europe is essentially godless. Secularism is a euphemism for godlessness. Europe is now secular. Church and state separate from each other. Why don't you Muslims understand as Christian, Europeans? We are, the, we are the leaders of the world in thought. We have separated church and state. Well, then if you have separated church and state, could you kindly explain to me how come a secular Europe persists in the Crusades, which were holy wars launched by a Pope? Can you explain to me that Britain continues the Crusades and brings the Crusades to its conclusion. Where's the evidence? In 1917, December, December 1917, when the British army defeated the Ottoman Islamic army and entered into Jerusalem, what did General Allenby say? The British general. He said, today the Crusades are now over. <laughs> and so we have a picture of Europe now 
in which prior to Nabi Muhammad wasalam, there is no recognition of the Holy Land of having any special status. But after Nabi Muhammad wasalam, there is an obsession, which is the name of the perfume as well. There is an obsession with the Holy Land. Good. Another Sunday morning, part of Europe decided to become Jewish. So now you have a white man who's a Jew. But this white man who becomes a Jew, he wants to liberate the Holy Land. And he wants to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. But he is a Johnny Comlately Jew. The real Jews are the cousins of the Arabs. And they're living in Yemen and in Iraq and in Morocco and in Egypt. Hmm? These we may call the Israelite Jews. And those we may call the white Jews. So the white Jews create the Zionist movement in 1897 and the white Jews succeed in getting the British government to make a deal with them in 1917 for the Balfour Declaration that it is the intention of the British government to work for the establishment of a Jewish national home in the Holy Land, Balfour Declaration, 1917, October. <coughs> The Zionist movement persists in that struggle until eventually they are able to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land between 1917 and 1948. In 1948, the Zionist movement succeeds in establishing the State of Israel. It's a European state. Eh? European people control the state. The Oriental Jews are called the Sephardic Jews and they have second class citizenship. The white man who is a Jew is called the Ashkenazi. He controls Israel. But the strange thing is that the Oriental Jews or the Israelite Jews never, never participated in the struggle to liberate the Holy Land. The only Jews who had that mission were the white men, who were Jews. And so I want to suggest to you a reinterpretation of history today. And that is that the Zionist movement is not an essentially Jewish movement. No. It's a European movement. A European movement to liberate the Holy Land, but camouflaged as a Jewish movement. It is Europe, whether Europe put on the clothes of Christianity, it is Europe, whether Europe put on the clothes of Judaism, it is Europe, whether Europe put on the clothes of secularism. All along the road, it is Europe. And so very clearly, using this verse of the, these two verses of the Quran, we are able to see that God and Magog must be located in European civilization, the white world. Now we want something better than that. We want to refine our position. It is too broad, <laughs> too broad that Gog and Magog are located in Europe. Where in Europe? Are they, is it the British people? <laughs> or the French or the German or the Spanish or the Portuguese? Or the Russians? Who are they? Gog and Magog. You go to the Bible, you can answer this question. The Christian scholarship cannot answer this question. Now then, we have to look in Europe for a people who after Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, are displaying a power 
which cannot be matched by any other power in the world. Today, of course, the whole of Europe, the Western world, possessed that power. But we want to go back in history to locate where it came from. Hmm? Now, a very interesting part of the subject now. At the time <coughs> of Nabi Muhammad there were two superpowers in the world. Which were they? Huh? It was called Rom. Rome, but it was the Byzantine Empire, which is headquarters in Constantinople. And the second one was the Persian Empire, Kesra. These were the two superpowers in the world at the time of the rise of Islam. Good. You know the history that the Muslim army, after the death of Nabi Muhammad the Muslim army challenged both the superpowers simultaneously and defeated them both. You know that? Simultaneously. And when both the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire were defeated, then Islam emerged as a superpower in the world without anything in the landscape to match it, to challenge it. Okay? We are the most powerful military force in the world. Okay. Within a hundred years of the death of the Prophet <coughs> we began our attempt to take over Europe. Whether you want to describe this as Islamic imperialism or not is a different subject which we are not going to enter into. The attack on Europe was launched from two directions. One was the minor attack and the other was the major attack. The minor attack was led by a man named Tariq and he took the ships through Gibraltar and so Gibraltar became known as Jabal Tariq Jabal mountain Tariq Jabal Tariq and the the corruption of that term Jabal Tariq is now Gibraltar like the name of the town is Beit Laham Beit Laham, meat market. What is it called today? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Hmm? Beit Laham. So Gibraltar. When he got over to the mainland, he burnt his boats. You remember? He had only 12,000 men with him. And then he fought, and eventually they were able to establish a Muslim stronghold in southern Spain which became known as Andalusia. And they remained there for, I think, about 500 years or so, until in 1492, the same year that Columbus landed in Trinidad, that same year the Muslims were expelled from Spain. But they advanced beyond southern Spain into southern France was halted by a man named Charles Martel or Charlemagne, Charlemagne. And the Muslim army could not penetrate the north. It's a small force, not a big army. But when they were able to hold on to southern Spain for something like 500 years or more. Huh? 800 and? 50 years, mashallah, we got some historians in this class. Now then, the major military trust into Europe by the new Islamic power in the world was not from the west but was from the east. The army passed through the Caucasus mountains to take on Europe. 
And guess what happened? As soon as that army passed the Caucasus Mountains, it met a power, a force. It could not budge. It could not budge. In Spain, they were able with a smaller force to defeat and take over southern Spain with a smaller force. But this, the main army of the most powerful military force in the world, grinds to a halt because a tribe called, where, where are they? Does anyone know the name of the tribe? Huh? Come on. That's right. That's right. K H A Z A R Khaza. The Khaza tribes of Central Europe where the Caucasus Mountains are. The Khaza tribes, or Khaza tribes, block the advance of the Muslim army and we could not move forward. And so this is a force more powerful than the most powerful military force in the world. It is these people Khaza, who was shortly after the death of the Prophet probably within a hundred years, decided to convert and become Jews one Sunday morning. Yeah? This is a historically documented fact. This is the phenomenon of the European Jew. The Khaza tribes, which displayed a military power, which made them more powerful than the most powerful military force in the world, the Khaza tribes decided to convert and become Jewish. But when they converted to become Jewish, they had no special relationship with the Torah. They were not religious people. They became Jews for essentially political purposes. And they never had any attachment with the Jewish religious law and the life that is sacred. <laughs> These European Jews now spread out from Central Europe and they go and they take over, for example, Poland. And Poland becomes almost totally controlled by the European Jew. Many Israeli rulers have come from Poland. Hmm? And then they leave Poland and they move out into Western Europe. And as they move out into yes, Western Europe, they become the driving forces behind the French Revolution. And they become the driving forces behind the Bolshevik Revolution, which overturns Russia. And having overturned Western Europe, they then cross the Atlantic. And over of a period of maybe 50 years or less, they're able to take control of the United States. To such an extent, that in 1916, the showdown took place. Henry Ford is the most popular American alive. He's an icon of America. He's the man who took the automobile, which was the exclusive privilege of the wealthy. Only the rich could afford a, a motor car. And Henry Ford, through his introduction of the production lines in Detroit, is able to bring down the cost of a Boloka to about $700 or $750. And so 
millions of Americans can now afford to buy a motor car thanks to Henry Ford. Henry Ford also doesn't bother about market wage and minimum wage. Henry Ford decides I want to pay my labor force a wage which is a just wage and me I care what the others pay. And so he pays a just wage and in paying a just wage and in showing his, his genius in establishing the production line <coughs> and bringing the motor car and making it available to the average American, Henry Ford became the most popular American, more popular than the president. In 1916, Henry Ford used all the power that he had, used all the wealth that he had to try to prevent the United States from entering the war. But the Jews had made a deal with Britain. What was the deal? If you will promise to give us the Holy Land, we'll bring the United States in the war. <coughs> Public opinion in the United States from 1914 to 1916 was against entering into the war. You can check all of this out, you know, yourself. Do the research. And yet, the European Jew who is now an American Jew, through his skillful control of the media, through his skillful manipulation of public opinion, through the skillful uh, influence he exerts upon the White House, the European Jew succeeds in 1916 in bringing the United States into the war. And so we now have identified something more than simple Western civilization, something more than simply the white world order. We are now, we are now capable of refining our definition and locating Gog and Magog in a special part of Europe from where they spread out. They are the Khaza tribes who eventually converted and became Jews. Now, let me recommend to you a book. There's only one real book to read on this subject. <coughs> THIR 13th Tribe by anybody remembers the name of the author? No? It's a Hungarian historian. Kursla, Kursla, K O E R S A E R. Something like that is the name. But the book is on the internet, you can download it. Just fiddle around with something like 13 tribe on the internet and see. Spell it. 13. The 13 tribe. Kersler, or whatever is his name, in describing the European Jew who has come from the Cheza tribe calls it the 13th tribe. Now then, before we end our subject of identifying Gog and Magog, when Gog and Magog are released, the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee. If you pass by the Sea of Galilee, you're heading for Jerusalem. And by the time the last of them pass, they'll say there used to be water here. So we're looking for a European people with that power who will be moving from Europe to the Holy Land. 
This is the European Jew. That's where he is now. And so we have come to the conclusion that we can now identify the origin of Gog and Magog in the Khazar tribes. But remember, when they are released, they make carbon copies of themselves. They take over different people, and as they take over a people, those people now begin to imitate the way of life of Gog and Magog. Like, did I tell you? But when I was a 14-year-old boy, I used to be 14 once upon a time. Yeah. SHA and I know that when we were boys, I mean, we never saw blue jeans. And then one Sunday morning as a teenager, we saw blue jeans for the first time. Everybody want to wear blue jeans now. But one horrible Sunday morning, we saw our sisters in blue jeans. What? We never saw a girl in blue jeans in all our lives. You all don't know this experience, you know, but we had. And then, worse than that came. The day when we saw our fathers were in blue jeans. And then even worse than that, the day when mothers started wearing blue jeans. And then worse than that, when grandpa started wearing blue jeans. <laughs> And then we see grandma in blue jeans. Huh? And then one day you see the priest in blue jeans. <laughs> you see the rabbi in blue jeans. And if you wait long enough, you might even see blue jeans on the mimbar giving the chutbah one day. And we saw the Chinese in blue jeans. And the Japanese in blue jeans. And holy of all holies, one day we saw the black African in the blue jeans. And then we saw the Arab in blue jeans. And the Persians in blue jeans. And even the Pakistanis in blue jeans. What going on? What going on? Is this by accident, I ask you? Put on your thinking cap. And so while Gog and Magog emerge from the Khazar tribes, that's only the origin. As they embrace other people, they expand, they multiply, and they create carbon copies of themselves. Until eventually 999 out of every 1000 becomes a carbon copy of Gog and Magog. When that happens, then the Muslim who follows Nabi Muhammad is a very lonely creature. Because he's out of step with the rest of the world. Hmm? Different. He's different. And they now grinding their teeth with anger. Why can't these Muslims dress the way we dress? Live the way we live. Why they always have to talk about this Insha'Allah and Subhanallah and Alhamdulillah and MashaAllah. But we give up that kind of language long, long, long time ago. We don't, we don't use these expressions anymore. But look at them Muslims. And so life becomes difficult for a Muslim. How difficult? What did the Prophet say about hot coals? He said the time will come when in order to live the life of Islam you will be, it will be equivalent to holding hot coals. You know what's the implication of that? If you have an Islam and you are moving serenely and quietly and peacefully and you have the experience of hot coals Brother, you ain't have Islam. That's the implication. All right, we will end with that today. Rabbana taqabal minna inna ka enta samir alim. Wa tub alayna ya mulana inna ka enta tawab rahim. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahim.